so hopefully yeah we'll, uh, this session should be um give you a lot of sort of insight and uh, be very informative uh we sort of you know draw upon the knowledge of our fantastic uh panelists here but as chris says do feel free at any time to do, you've got some questions about the subject matter that we're discussing please just pop them in uh into the chat and uh, uh chris will get them uh sort of directed to the right person on the panel for you as well and we'll try and answer them as we go so uh a bit of a, a bit of a broad question to begin with um and i'm going to sort of pass my way through the panelists here on this one um but the question is how did you get into the audio industry and i think here we'll just we'll, we'll start off with rob on this one and we'll just walk our work our way uh through the panelists so rob uh what was your sort of uh, trajectory and what was your in um so i actually uh i i wasn't really too interested in sound um i wasn't going to go to college uh well continue with college after the age of 18 um and then i decided to do a diploma in dj and music production at dbs in plymouth um and on that course that led me on to composing a piece for a trailer um which i really enjoyed doing um and then that kind of stemmed into getting into sound for picture which led me on to the degree which i just completed in bristol Fantastic. Uh, well, congratulations to you. Uh, so again, say the same question to Chris then as well. Um, what was your sort of like first sort of in, what was your first taste, your foot in the door uh, into the audio industry, Chris? I mean, well, it was about 20 years ago, I, I did HND in um, music tech, but um, I'd always been interested in music. And, uh, you know, since then it, it sort of snowballed, really. I, I just did two years HND and um, from that just created a record label and I uh, worked various jobs and it sort of snowballed into really what I'm doing now. Um, but it, it was just sort of having that interest and working towards it. It was something I did in, in, in my mid twenties, to be honest. So I was quite a late starter. It, well, I wasn't 18 when I went to college or anything like that. So it's, it, it progressed from there really. And that, do, do, do you think those extra couple of years, like, so I, I guess sort of starting the label, that was quite a bit of, um, uh, you need to have quite a lot of motivation. Do you think a couple of extra years there in terms of sort of maturity helped with that and uh or you yeah you would have been able to do that do you think equivalently at sort of 16. oh no yeah no i would have been able to do it when i was 16 definitely i just didn't have that opportunity when i was growing up at all i mean this is like i mean you're looking you know 30 years ago really almost you know so it didn't exist um so it, yeah i mean it helped because when i was there I, I was on it you know every day i was in the studio creating and crafting um maybe I would have had that hunger if I was 18, definitely, you know, so, but it helps. Yeah. Mm. You know, I suppose it's a little bit older and wiser. Everyone was like 18. I was like 25, 26. It was insane. But, uh, it was a good laugh though. So. I'd definitely say there was a lot of difference between me at 16 and me at 18. I think there was yeah, a, there was yeah. a bit of, there's a bit of growing up somewhere in, totally in those helps. couple of years that, that made a big difference. So yeah, it helps. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay. And, uh, and Joel, uh, how about yourself? I guess I've been, trying to sort of figure out how to make my way in music for a long time. I remember being really little and buying like a really, I don't even know if it exists still, some kind of software called Music Maker, like really on the nose. And it wouldn't run on the windows that I had at the time, like on my parents' computer. But it's always been kind of like a curiosity. And then I worked my way through college and there was like a small little studio space in college and I was just making sure that I'd book it out as much as I could, as much as they'd allow me to in a week. And yeah, just it, it was something that was always there and I chipped away at it and did a degree in electronic engineering really. But while doing, I made sure that I did modules of music technology and production and stuff like that on the side. And yeah, kind of really came out of university, scratching my head, was looking at maybe doing a master's in some kind of engineering or um, music production thing. And then got the opportunity to go to EVE and um, start as an assistant at EVE, which was life changing really, I guess, because that really set me down the path. So, yeah. Fantastic, thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, right. finally, Emily, uh, how about yourself? Um, so I started um, more as like an artist and producer to begin with. So I wrote songs and then I wanted to create the worlds of the sound around them. I didn't want to just hand it over to someone else to do. So I just learned um, on the job. I just learned whilst I was doing it, like making songs, putting them out, producing them, starting really shit, getting better slowly. Um, and then, sorry, can I swear? I didn't know, I just swore. <laughs> you just did. I just did. <laughs> um, 
And then, so I was doing that for like six years or so um, and touring and gigging and all that stuff as well. So kind of doing all of it. And then I, um, COVID happened and I had some time and I decided to do, um, I really wanted to study production for a while and like formalize all the stuff I'd picked up and picked up of other producers and things. So I did the one year course um, at DBS in Bristol um, just over a year ago now. So I finished last summer. And then I, my tutor there, who was great, Josh Hills said, you've got an ear for mastering, you should launch a mastering business. So I did, um, and that's going really well. And then with my own music now, I've applied everything I've learned to that. And now I've signed with a label and releasing stuff through them as well. So it's, yeah, it's it's been a long time kind of producing and doing stuff and learning uh, in a more weird, wonky way. And then formalizing and kind of, um, have, yeah applying that to my weird wonky music and improving <laughs> it <laughs> basically yeah uh look, sort of learning some sort of you know technical uh jargon for some of the things that you're already doing yeah 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 and, le and, and learning which rules you're actually breaking which i think is always yeah really and choosing if i so, want to break oh, yeah. or not whereas, rather than just doing it <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, fantastic okay so um next question for chris um when you're you know you're looking for new talent you're hiring what sort of skill sets are you looking for uh at oscillate recordings yeah i mean look, look there's a lot of people who, who are competent in you know uh sound engineering have been taught it's you, you need a little bit more than that um it's not about how good you can create a tune it's it's for me as, as a business uh, owner it's what you can bring to the business and i think very very few people do this when they apply and uh, what, what's really interesting is how they can improve what what we're doing at oscillate bring some clients to us uh how would you develop the existing model that we have and i know it's quite in depth for someone to sort of do that but anyone who's came to me and said that are pretty much guaranteed um you know get a foot in the door with what we're doing um because there's so many applicants who say yeah i can work pro tools i can work logic I'm good at mastering but there's very few people who can come in and go right well i, I want to be part of what you're doing and grow what you're doing as well and that's so important i mean you could be doing looking at social media or the website and go this is how we can improve it you know, I can do all this as well, you know, Pro Tools, I, you know, I can work with various people, but that's definitely a key factor. And, and, and it's, it's how I got my um, first job at a studio as well, was bringing clients to them um, and, and improving what they were doing. Um, and, and that's, and, and there's a few people have got on board who've done that for us as well. So that's that's that's, that's, that's 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 great and what a, what a, an amazing insight from you, because I think that, you're, you know, you're, you're absolutely right there, aren't you? And you, it's, you, you're running a business. And um, you, it's really important to keep that business to grow and kind of develop and in order for you to kind of reinvest in that business and, you know, make, make it viable. And I think sometimes, you know, when people talk about um, coming in and sort of, you know, initiatives, I've got some ideas for things. These can also be little small ideas, can't they? You know, just yeah. what they used to refer to as like, the, the, you know, the kind of marginal gains, you know, where can we just be a, bit, yeah. a little bit more efficient here? And that stems from this sort of like critical thinking approach doesn't it? The, like the ability to sort of analyze something to kind of take yes. a look at it and see if there's any kind of efficient saving or is there a way to grow something, you know, where is there an issue yeah. with it? Yeah, I, 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 I want an engineer or, you know, to, to grow with the company. I, I don't want someone who's going to be here for a few weeks and then it's a stepping mm. stone. I'm always looking for someone, you know, to be with me for, for as long as they can, you know, grow together and that's the way, to, you know, we, we can do things. So yeah, definitely for sure. It's really, really, really useful advice, Chris. And I think that, you know, that's something a lot of our students can take away in, in thinking a bit more from a business perspective, as well as just that sort of skills and knowledge um, sort of uh, perspective of, of, of our own skills and when we're offering stuff up in, in terms of CVs and things. Yeah, definitely. Because, I mean, everyone's so well trained from these places, um, you know, like yourselves, there's a, there's a lot of, you know, places, but it's thinking, of, you know, out of the box a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're applying to a studio, I'm not, you know, as a producer and engineer as well but it's it's a business as such what can you yeah. do what can you bring to us i think i think it's that key thing you know one of the things that we kind of really try and instill in our students here is this ability to take risks you know yeah. to try things and i think you know education is the perfect place for that isn't it where you've got this sort of you've got a bit of a safety net here you know you can have a go at things and it might not work out but at least you you were brave enough just to take that initiative to try kind of a, a, a different innovation that you thought might work 
And yeah. so, you know, experimenting in education is probably like a good way to kind of get those, develop a bit more of those skills that you're looking for there, Chris. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Okay, fantastic. Um, okay, next question uh, for, for Rob and Joel. Um, you both progressed into jobs straight out of university. What were your sort of steps um, to, to achieve this? Uh, should we, we'll start with, uh, let's start with Rob. Um, yeah, so while um, while studying at DBS the whole time, I was actually working full time uh, in a bar in Bristol. Um, and it was it was after the first lockdown um, when kind of things were going back to nor starting to go back to normal. And um, I turned down a job I got offered uh, working on a set um, purely because I couldn't get the time off work. And then I thought to myself, what? You know why am I why am I doing this? It, I want to work in this industry, and I'm rejecting work in the industry. Um, so I quit my job and basically just started taking on as much as I can. Um, even jobs, you know, I wasn't thinking about being paid loads of money or anything like that. I was just like, go out, meet people, meet meet filmmakers, you know, spread across the country, just meet as many people as I can, because um, that's really where you're going to find the work. And I was just really lucky that um, it was actually the third film i ever did um a chap who was uh, just a camera assistant on there owns his own company based in penrith and he's doing all sorts of productions for netflix he's doing stuff with amazon he's doing tv shows and it just basically we got along and he was essentially like come and work for me you're a good soundy and i i was just really lucky in that instance but um it was something that uh, Ben Philcox, our course leader, basically instilled into me throughout the course was just networking. He was like, even if even if they ask you to make people dinner, just go do it because you're going to meet yeah. people. Um, yeah. yeah. Great advice. Great advice. I've always found I've, I've, I think networking is one of the things I've always found a little bit icky in terms of a term. And, and the thing I've, I've started to really um, come down on is like is developing a community. And, I, and for some reason, that feels better to me, you know, this idea of like developing these, these people that I'm in touch with that are part of this community that, that you know, can provide this opportunity. That's incredible. So Pen, did you say Penrith? Penrith, yeah, in Cumbria. Yeah, that, Cumbria, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Maybe. yeah. yeah. So they're based in Hounslow um, in Cumbria. Mm. Um, I think they're looking at relocating in the next year. But um, they... Wow. they it's a beautiful place to be, isn't it? Why, yeah. <laughs> Exactly. And I mean, the chap, he got his way into the industry just through, he started out doing kit hire. So just renting out equipment and then, you know, that built and built and built. And then he's a uh, writer and director and, uh, you know, he knows all, all sorts of production, even audio. So, um, you know, even when I'm, when I've done projects for him and I show him my work, he critiques it quite heavily because he knows what he's talking about. So <laughs> very useful to have a friend like that yeah <laughs> okay that's great uh thanks rob and um joel yourself so were there sort of like particular steps that you took as you sort of finished up in terms of your undergraduate um i guess kind of seconding what rob said really um i, I came out of university and i had a few part-time jobs um i was a bit unsure where i was going to go with it looking at masters potentially and then i just kind of suddenly had a realization that i guess something I can't remember who, who kind of told it me but it stuck with me that plan a has to work in this kind of scenario and you know you throw yourself into it and Rob said that he felt like he was lucky but I don't know kind of of the belief that in these scenarios you by by being so forward with what you want to do and plan a has to work you create your own look really so for me that was that I was sort of, I was sending my emails around to various studios and through a friend, like an old friend from school, um, his older brother was working as an engineer at Eve at the time. And I just reached out to him and was like, oh, can I just come and have a look around? Joined him on a session and he just kind of showed me like the studio. And then I just caught the owner, Martin, on my way out and was speaking to him and said, well, you know, I." did an electronic engineering degree I can help out you know I can help craft some XLRs and just really simple stuff stuff like that and got some ideas of how to improve the business um well that those to be fair those came later as well yeah um <laughs> like I ended up doing a lot of social media stuff like that and yeah. just making myself like Chris says really you can't really you you can't expect to go to a studio and just go and assist or engineer or produce do you know what i mean like the reality is that these places these studios they're they are a business and there's so many different elements to it other than the sound that you need to help out really like i i used i mean 
you know, there's the whole thing of being the pot wash and the tea maker, but those that they're really important. And, you know, like my career, like in retrospect, conversations with artists who were working in Eve while I was literally pouring them a brew of like really propelled my career forward in terms of, you know, like meeting people in that networking scenario alone, really. Like mm -hmm. we just, you know, people will be like, oh, you should meet this person. And then you go to a gig and it just snowballs mm -hmm. from there. So, yeah. Yeah. I'd be very interesting. I think the, 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 the common thing both there, on that, and as you just touched on this, like it's not necessarily luck, is it? But that you've been incredibly proactive. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 searching those things out and trying to make those opportunities uh, come to you. Yeah. I'm the more like the reality is, is the risks involved with that means that you're more likely to be lucky than if you don't try and take them anyway. Yeah, <laughs> very true. So. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, okay, so Emily, um, uh, you studied with us at a kind of level three, um, so wasn't um, necessarily going on to undergraduate, but for someone who's on the fence about how far they want to take education, do you have any sort of advice for them? Um, it depends what you want, really. It, to it really depends what you want. Like, um, for me, because I'd already been doing music for like six years, I just wanted to take a year to focus on it. And I'd heard that the, um, the one year course was really good and really practical, which is what really suited me. Just loads of time in the studio, filling in any gaps in my knowledge, learning more about things like mastering that I hadn't learned before. Um, so for me, one year was enough, but mm -hmm. I know people from my one year course that have gone on to do the three year course who love it um, who maybe didn't have as much experience beforehand. So they wanted to spend more time in education. Whereas for me, I was like, I've done a year. I just need to get out there and set up my business. And I've got so much I want to do. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. for me, I was just, I just wanted to do it and get out there and get going. Yeah. Um, but if you feel, it depends on what you want really. Like if you feel like, oh, I really want more time in education. There's so much more I want to learn. Mm -hmm. um then definitely do do spend more time doing it, it just mm. I think that's really interesting because you yeah yeah you had a kind of like quite a clear um sort of like direction where you were going and you were very motivated there weren't you so that yeah. year kind of just like okay now I've filled in the gaps where I wasn't quite sure and like you know I'm gonna go off and do this and and sometimes that might be perfect for people isn't it you know like the, mm. the thing of education is you can you can go and try these things and, and maybe it's like okay well i've done that and you know it didn't quite work out the way it was so now i can you know i can go back and, back and do a little bit more study or do those opportunities weren't there or you're not quite you haven't quite figured out what it is yet that you're there and so the education can be the thing that you sort of work on so the, you know, it's quite nice there's the sort of flexibility for people these days to be able to do that especially with sort of master's degrees and being funded with loans now as well it gives mm. people the option to kind of come back and have a little stuff uh, look at that a bit later on i think the master's is a nice option as well i did consider doing that or like doing the one year course and then going on to do a master's as well mm. but just for me it was it made me just to get it cracking basically yeah but, <laughs> but yeah the masters as well as a cool as another cool option i think like if you don't right. want to spend three years if you've already done a degree before or whatever which i have then maybe you want to do like yeah a masters or something as well there's lots of options yeah. Yeah, and I definitely, I, I, my master's I part time while I was working full time as well, and so that's a, there's a lovely way to sort of like, and I was work, using my work as part of my master's as well. And I think that's a it's a really nice thing where you can use sometimes professional practice to kind of deliver on the qualifications as well, just to kind of mm. you know, utilize best of time. <laughs> well, actually, the EP that I created whilst I was studying is now the one that um, I'm releasing with the label. So the EP uh -huh. I was working on whilst I was studying is now getting released and stuff. So it, it, there's definitely crossover. Fantastic. Uh, that's amazing distinction and then publish right <laughs> <laughs> okay um just uh i think uh joel um i've got a question for you yes based on your experience what are the essential skills both sort of technical and interpersonal that make a great sound engineer um i mean i guess interpretation is something for me that i kind of i try constantly when I'm not working to listen to as much wider base of music as possible and understand where art is coming from. And then other than that, I guess it is all social. Like Chris was saying before, there are so many engineers out there who can do logic and pro tools. And like, there's a, there's a plateau of 
like ability obviously like everyone is improving with time like there's objective things to mixing and engineering but the reality is that when you're in a studio setting working with an artist it's a social environment as much as a professional environment and you're there because the artist gets along with you as much as they think that your work is great and I think for me just being generally just friendly and easygoing and in scenarios where I'm producing or taking more of a creative lead I'm always eager to concede if it's gonna spare if it's gonna you know just make the make everything easier and those kind of things really just being open and friendly and yeah just make things work for the artist the 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 main compliment for me at the end of a session would be that was really easy i think i think i think that's that's the goal so yeah yeah just uh, for me just just be just be nice just be just be a friend to the artist i think that was one of the best uh things we uh we had a, an amazing person working with us um and she i remember observing her talk, talking to the students once and she was talking about the industry and she just said just be nice to everyone yeah that's that's it and i just thought that wasn't just you know not just yeah just what a great message for life as well you know just yeah. like, just, just just be nice you know just yeah. it was as simple as that <laughs> that's um, that's yeah. Chris, I'd, I'd, I'd like to sort of grab your thoughts there as well. Um, essential skills, both technical and inter interpersonal, kind of, you know, making a great sound engineer. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, look, it's, it's great to be technical, but I agree with Joel. It's, it's about that interpersonal skills as well. It's about treating these pe people that come through with, with the utmost respect, you know, that they are um, essentially, you know, your wages in a way. Mm -hmm. um, so you've got to, yeah, you know, treat them uh, yeah really nicely as friends and and it's about it's about how, how you sort of deal with certain situations it is quite stressful to be times where the recording isn't going well the, the drummer can't get the takes right it's 20 mm -hmm. takes and they're, they're in pieces mm -hmm. you know you've, you, you're you the team lead you've got to drag them up from the from the depths of, of despair sometimes you know and then um, you've got to get them back up g'd up and then you go and you know, you could have all the technical ability in the world, but if you can't do that, then that, that session's finished, you know, mm -hmm. so there's certain times when, when you have them situations. So it, it is, it, it's, it's, it is a lot of psychology involved. Um, yeah. You know, part-time part -time therapist. Yes, really. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's not about just, you know, patching things in and talking about compressors, EQs and mm -hmm. really, really technical. I mean, it helps. Yeah. You, you've got to have that, but I'd say it's almost, can be 50 50 in certain circumstances mm. if you're not mm -hmm. great with people it can really put it you know it, 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 but you know off track a little bit sometimes unless yeah. you're an absolute technical genius and uh, you know the band <laughs> or whoever or artists yeah. will just go with it because you know that's 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 the quirk you are but i think that, that's a, that's a rarity really so it's very important i agree with mm. you 100 yeah i mean i often see you know because quite difficult sometimes we a lot of a lot of producer or electronic musicians are very they're quite sort of headphones on they're quite sort of solitary workers and you know developing these skills isn't always that easy it's not as easy as kind of developing the technical skills you know these are things that you can sort of sit and learn on your own and mm -hmm. um i think you know uh, rob you mentioned sort of working in a bar and i think back to you know when i was working in supermarkets and things like that and i was dealing with like difficult customers and things like that and you know developing just that way to interact with people that you know you get all different sort of circumstances crop up and things like that you know it's not necessarily that easy to teach people these things no, but you've got to put yourself in a situation to experience it haven't you and sort of you know find a way to kind of learn how that communication works and and, and ways to interact with people that that is right for the situation do you would, would you have any advice there rob in terms of you know you must have um I don't know if you've always been really good with communicating with people, you know, is there a way that you've developed sort of those skills and interactions? What, working in hospitality was definitely a good way of practicing, um, I'll be honest. Um, but, you know, e echoing um, what they were just saying as well. Um, I mean, I know a particular producer and he literally hires people 50 50 on skill and personality. Um, you could be the most talented person. He could be getting you for a good price, but if you if you've not got the personality, he will not hire you. Um, I mean, the first job I ever did 
with those guys I, I showed up to a meeting told them i had the equipment i had no experience but i got along with them made them laugh so they gave me the job um and I think, yeah, that is a really important thing, especially especially jumping around when you're meeting loads of different crew. I mean, in my experience, obviously being on a film set um, is a bit different. You meet tons and tons of people, but even just, you know, being friendly with every single member of the crew, cast, getting along with everyone. Because as well, you know, they like they said, they are your wages. And I also see it as this is opportunity for future work. I've had actors ring me up going, oh, we're doing a short here. We need a soundy. It's paid and it's like, oh, great, you know like someone who came in for three hours of filming while we were shooting in the middle of the woods or something that's benefited me in some way um so yeah i think i think be, being fr friendly and uh communicating with people properly is very very important maybe learn a few good jokes as well then <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> all right um emily last october you formed your own mastering company congratulations uh, could you talk about the experience so far, sort of, you know, from setting up your own business to building and managing your client base? Cool. Um, well, actually, it was in July I set up. And the reason it's I think you guys have October is because, which is kind of interesting, that's when I set up my Instagram. So first of all, uh -huh. I set up. Yeah. So first <laughs> of all, I set up my website and I did a few little bits of work. I did a few test masters, which I've never done it again um I know some people do but I don't like it I just think like just pay people um so so I um did a couple of um test masters and then I used those to like show as a bit of portfolio and I showed some of my own work um and I sent it around to a load of people that I knew in the industry um other artists and I sent it out on a few Facebook pages and things like that, got in some work, built a portfolio from that, and then launched Instagram in October. Basically used that as like a shop front. Um, I did like this online, um, bit like this, like an online panel thing with Kate Tavini, who was amazing, amazing mastering engineer. And so, um, so great at explaining how to kind of build up business. Um, I did a few like interviews. I sort of, basically I, I did a business plan. And I worked out what my target market was, which for me at this stage is like emerging artists, um, a lot of female um, artists and producers, male, any gender, of course, as well, but um, that is like a niche of my market. So I worked that out, worked out what I was doing, digital masters. Um, and then, yeah, just, just started working basically. And then just kept posting up what I was doing, reaching out to people and just, it's still building now, just like building it and just making sure that I'm just um, really reliable. And I really care because I come from a background of creating my own music too. I think part of what I love offering people is that I don't think I know best because I didn't like that when I made stuff myself when mastering engineers or mixers are like, oh yeah, I know what you need. It's like, uh, so I ask people for references and stuff and we chat about what they like and what, what they kind of imagine for their sound. And what's really cool about that is then it's given me loads of experience giving lots of different feels of masters. I haven't got like one particular sound that's sort of my sound for mastering I sort of I'm flexible I have my same chain and approaches but I'm flexible in my approach to kind of what people want um, and people seem to really like it so it's just yeah being really um, I'm trying to be quite quick as well trying to do good turnarounds mm -hmm. to people be really communicative be really nice like the other guys are saying just be nice to people um, yeah so that's it basically and just keep well, Instagram is where I get most of my work from now. It was, um, and some articles that I got interviewed for, people seem to find those and message me and stuff. Um, so that's it at the moment. And then yeah, just keep building it that way. Um, cool. Yeah, and also um, speaking with other people in the industry is really great because I think with mastering, it's a bit more solitary than working as like a recording engineer or a mixing engineer, which is kind of fine for me because the other side of my career as an artist producer is very sociable so that's kind of okay but I did go I went for some drinks the other day with um fluid mastering who are lovely who've been wanting to go for drinks for a while um, um and like just sort of mixing with other master engineers other mixing people I did a mix with a master's course recently that I won a scholarship to go on and met loads of like different mixing engineers and mastering engineers around the world it's just nice to like 
keep networking I guess I find networking weird as well I don't really understand what I'm doing <laughs> but I just talk to people <laughs> you know I think it's just it's a nice way to meet other people doing what you do and yeah it just seems to you never know what's going to help it organically grow your mm. business you know as well as the um, things that you do you know consistently to build it there's loads of other things you should just do like go and meet people and do this and see what happens basically yeah absolutely I, those conversations i'm always absolutely fascinated in other people's approaches you know to similar the things that we do similarly and uh you know it's those things where you can kind of just soak up a little a few ideas here and there and things you can go and experiment with and again it's just it's not just about kind of making those connections it's about kind of building that understanding and knowledge base and sort of approaches and things isn't it and getting to have fun. really geeky chats with people as well <laughs> it's really nice having like really geeky chats with people everyone's like nodding yeah. <laughs> at the mix of the masters things we were just like every evening drinking loads of beer and just talking about really geeky things but it was I'm making like jokes that were like none of our friends back home would laugh at this joke this is awful so it's, like, <laughs> it's just really nice isn't it to like yeah yeah, yeah. yeah in good in good company yeah. uh so chris similarly uh, could you talk about the decisions um to form oscillate recordings and how you sort of grew that business over the years did you have a kind of particular strategy or was there, you know, no, really. how, did it, how did this formulate itself? I mean, I've, I've never, it's a weird one. I mean, the, the, the studio was, was some of that sort of grew organically, really. I mean, my background was that I wanted to be an artist as such. Um, so, it, I mean, I, mean I, I set up a record label and that sort of was the main source of income at one point. Um, and I also was working in various studios as well. So it was more people were asking me to do stuff because of the label and it grew from there. I just saw an opportunity probably about, it probably was about 10 years ago um, just to set something small up in Manchester. And it was really just to sort of bring a bit of income in, to be honest. Um, and, you know, hopefully I might develop artists, things like that. It, it was never like, yeah, I want to have a space and I want to put a desk in it and such and such. And, and it, it just sort of grew from there. And I guess, um, I got a little bit lucky. I got some uh, funding in place to basically, I got, I got an investor who helped us out build the studio. In fact, I just specced out a studio for a client and that was how I sort of uh, fell into it a little bit more. It, it just grew exponentially with what I was doing. People, you know, I was getting more and more demand of, you know, mixes, mastering, writing for people because I can do it all the right myself. And, and it sort of just snowballed really. And then, you know, I've got this studio now and I suppose it's just an outlet of what, what I do for people um, and, it's, and it's become a business as such so yeah it, it, it's a strange one it, 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 I, I never sort of set out to sort of achieve what I've done really but I, I, what I'd set out to do was have a career in music and, and this is where I've got basically I'm still growing it all the time still learning still yeah. developing things I've still got a strategy for what I want to be doing in say five years time you know so I'm, I'm always progressing with it you know I'm quite ambitious I want to keep going that's good so you that drive to grow and kind of keep developing is still there and that the way you said it sort of grew quite organically do you um you know is that do you think that's just through the kind of word of mouth you know just doing a really good job for people and the sort of you know people being really pleased with with, with the service that you're offering well again it was just a gap in the market really because i mean about 10 years ago when i set up there was a lot of big studios and um, it literally just set it up from a room here i mean you know i was using Ableton logic and was getting really good at that but it was it was through sort of well it wasn't social media at that point it was it was about Google so basically I figured out a way of getting to the very top of Google charts and, and on the way that I was doing so if you type in Manchester recording studio it came top so it was beating a lot of people I figured out a way of doing it um, and then from that I just got tons and tons of work from it because I was projecting what I was doing so I was literally just grafting all the time trying to figure this thing out because uh, you know i didn't have any money whatsoever it's like i think it's set it up about a couple of grand and you know for, from a redundancy um i think i was working at a, a college at the time so it, it was it, it just snowballed from there really but i figured out a way of trying to get people in and, and every, you know you've all touched on it about you know instagram or facebook getting out there and getting people i mean it was it was a similar thing i think, I think it was myspace back in the day um but I mean that that brought in all my gigs, all my sort of you know DJ work, club work, stuff like that, and then I just sort of went more away from that and, and developed the studio side of it. So it was really figuring it out through 
uh, a WordPress site in Google, really. That sort of brought everything through and, and the knowledge that I have, you know, I've just got out there and, and built from there, really. Amazing. Well, you've, you've done very, very well. You've done you very well, hasn't it? <laughs> um, uh, I suppose, you know, it's one of the it's one of the difficult things, you know, working in this industry when you're you're kind of working for yourself and you're, you know, some months can be great, other months can be a bit, you know, a bit sparse. And it yeah. it, it does it does sort of have that fluctuation um often. Uh, and I guess, you know, Joel, Rob, Emily, do you have any kind of advice for people who are sort of in that? place at the minute and you know and we've spoken about the, the the importance of that community that sort of network of, of of contacts and things but are there any other things that you think are really um useful for for finding those work the clients you know this sort of side of social media is there anything else at the minute that you feel um you could give us kind of good advice uh, for people in that place at the minute um i guess Say what like what Emily was saying, really. Instagram is my crutch at the moment. Um, a lot of my communication with bands that starts early usually starts through Instagram and it, it'll start relatively earnest. I just, like if I'll let people know that I'm a fan of the stuff that they've been working on, and it's more along the lines of you know, if you ever wanted to try and do anything and work together in any kind of capacity, then. I'd absolutely love that, and we could, I'm sure we could work something out, and then seeing where it goes from there, really. So um, that, that sort of reaching out, that kind of really, really sort of paying an interest in people, and, and being really careful about sort of listening to what they're doing, and you know, yeah, I got a bit of admiration, and you know, respect. In that I way. think so. I just don't. I, I I don't think that there's really anything to gain from messaging someone straight out of the blue being like let's collab kind of thing it's I don't know I I think the reality is that if I was I put myself in the artist's shoes and you know you get a cold message regardless who are being like let's work together it's quite a you know it's it's quite un, unnerving almost being like whoa I think most people, so, most you know, people consider it to be spam yeah, exactly. Yeah, Somebody so, you've never met before, you don't know. It's. I think you know. Just the reality is, it like on social media, everyone kind of needs to sort of sniff around each other a bit first. You know what I mean? Like, so I'll we'll, I'll have a slow conversation with the band, and you know we'll see if we're on the same page, and then you know the possibility of working together or may or may not happen. Like you know, I've had successes. I've ended up making friends via it. It's not like a, it's not necessarily like an end game. Like this has to work. It's just there's uh, there's I'm, I'm a fan of music at the end of the day, and I'm just letting people know that I like what they're doing. And you know, if that turns into work, great. If not, then uh, well, that's fine. At the end of the day, like I still have an admiration for what they're doing, and yeah. Great, yeah, good, good advice. Uh, Rob, yourself, you got any sort of like, you know, are there any sort of tactics or ways that you would um, sort of, you know, if it's a bit of a difficult month or time? Um, I mean, what I, it's a difficult one, um, especially with sort of what, what I mean, in, in the kind of audio industry for everyone, nothing's um, always consistent or promised. I've had jobs put on the table that have been taken away very quickly as well. Um, but I mean, one of the things I've kind of learned, especially in the last, I mean, three or four months or so is not to panic if you don't have anything booked in, because this, this always seems to happen every time I'll book something in and then maybe two or three jobs pop up. And I'm like, I was worrying about not, you know, being able to pay everything this month or being a bit short for cash. And, you know, um, it's, it, it, yeah, it's not been too bad, but I mean, I just try to you know put my foot in as many places as i can if that's the right saying like instagram is a great one i get messaged on instagram all the time whether it's students or um you know international filmmakers i've had quite a few people contact me from india and america um saying about doing like it, collaboration projects um mandy although i don't really like mandy but kind of i've got that kind of a in the back burner if you know if i'm struggling a bit i can go on there and you know type in southwest sound recordist and it comes up with every job that's advertised on there in the southwest 
Um, but really for me, it's just kind of word of mouth. A lot of, a lot of my work comes from either people I've worked with or again, students, um, that I met through, uh, DBS. Um, a lot of the chaps who are actually in the year above me, um, I'm in touch with and we're constantly bouncing work between each other. There's a particular, um, chap called Aaron Kennedy and me and him are always messaging each other. Like a job comes up, I go, Aaron, I can't do this. I give it to him. He does it. And then two weeks later, he's like, Rob, I can't do this job. And then he gives it to me. So, you know, it's, um, yeah, I, I, I guess don't 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 worry about it too much, um, because as long as you're presenting yourself properly and you've met the people, things will come, I suppose. Yeah, thanks, Rob. Thanks, Rob. And um, Emily, you, you've also mentioned Instagram, um, but just thinking, you know, these things, they don't always last forever. You've have you got sort of like one eye on like, you know, the next platform that might be kind of coming through or anything yeah. like that, or you're just I like, this TikTok. is working for me. <laughs> I hate TikTok um no are you, think, are you are you conscious are you aware of that are you thinking is there anything in the back of your mind you're thinking okay this isn't going to be the kind of like the 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 in forever for, for mm -hmm. all that communication there is a possibility that it might stop and i'm going to have to change strategy here or anything like that or at the minute you're just kind of going with it and let's just I'm kind of going with it at the moment i think instagram's pretty sound i mean who knows but i feel like it's going to be pretty sound for a while um but I guess good advice about that is just like if you're trying to figure out where your the people you want to work with are then it's just seeing where they hang out isn't it like so if that's in real life or online where do people go it could be like mm. music blogs and stuff like that as well or um i don't know like production based um stuff to do with that online or it could be going to events i went to a few like real life meetup things as well um so there's always other options. I do I do rely quite a lot on Instagram right now, and I wasn't worrying about it. <laughs> I wasn't worrying about it. But um, you know, things change all the time, don't they? So um, but I mean where I'm at where I'm at right now anyway is like thinking potentially to try and work for like a larger mastering company or something like that at some point. And um now that I've built up a bit of my own work, who knows? Um or maybe continue to do freelance i'm sort of letting it grow and seeing what happens um yeah. well things, yeah. things, things do change you know uh you could, chris still isn't like you know uh banging on that myspace um uh page you should, you should be back we I, I miss i think that the music industry <laughs> would be better off if myspace was back <laughs> 100%. <laughs> I'm like, I'm okay okay well there's, there's five <laughs> there's five people here, here who can start that uh I think what we what we might do is we're just going to cross over for a bit of a question from one of the um the attendees today. Um, this one I believe is for Emily. So, uh, what are some key insights or things you wish you knew specifically in relation to the transition from artist writer to mixing engineer? You know, mixing mastering engineer. The specialist uh, sort of key insights on things that you. Uh, in terms of technically, or in terms of like. So the things you wish you knew specifically in relationship you know I, I guess um you know what have you learned as you've uh, as you've been doing the job in in uh, as, as a kind of engineer that you think uh might have been good to kind of have a bit of insight into that prior to before, before arising there are there things that you've got oh crikey i didn't i didn't realize you know how important this was that you know maybe you don't know as an artist yeah. or a writer it's a very different role i think it's very it's very very different um it's I don't know if I call it a supportive role, but it does feel like that. It's like you have to, I get given tracks and I, I really care about them and want them to sound amazing. So you're serving that and you're kind of, I try and set like rough deadlines with artists, depending on what sort of they, what works for them, what they kind of suggest, but those move. I didn't realize, I guess I've done it as an artist to mastering engineers before and I didn't realize how much deadlines can move. That's a big insight that I'm, working through recently and I actually I asked um Nick from Fluid Mastering about that and he was like oh it still happens to me as well I'm like oh it's just a thing isn't it the deadlines move like how do you balance your calendar um I guess is one insight and work balancing your time also I guess the most it's kind of similar to producing for yourself but you have to have, work out your structure how you want to structure your days um and how you want to kind of uh, uh, like you need to also make sure you spend time not just on because I've had points where I've had quite a lot of work and I've just been doing the work and I haven't been 
promoting myself and then I'm like oh now I need to promote myself again because I've just been doing the work like so you really need to um make sure you're like now I've laid out a few basic rules for myself like I will do this many hours a week promoting myself which I haven't done this week I've been naughty and been working on my fo my mixes instead but that's fine I'll do some tomorrow um so like things like that trying to build structure for yourself I guess um which I did already as an artist and producer but even more so because you um you have a lot more of other people's deadlines that you're working to and there's a lot more possibility of change that you don't have control over as well so working out plans for that um keeping your books it's really boring stuff but like keeping your books is really important um I don't know just like having a, a, I, I see it what's been really nice for me about this whole process is I before saw my music and production as sort of my business and sort of my art and now that I have my mastering business, I sort of see that as my business, which is creative and I love, and I can focus on my music more just as art and not as, it's always a business, but not as much, you know, like mastering is where I have more of my business mindset. So I guess approaching it like that, thinking through things a lot before you do them, planning things out. Um, yeah, I don't know if that's helpful. I think that's really helpful. I think that, that sort of self-discipline um that you mentioned there sometimes as an artist it's very easy just to spend unlimited amounts of times on certain things and i know i've got you know a, a deadline way off where i'm delivering on a on a product for somebody but when you when your week is much more um interactive with lots of different people that sort of scheduling scheduling and discipline and as you said there you know having really identifying the time to you know i'm really going to work on sort of social stuff here and marketing and this is how many hours i need to do a week those sorts of things are really useful and good insights for people. I think that that sort of structure and self-discipline, mm. really useful. Thank you, thank you, Emily. Um, uh, uh, and you're very popular today. You've got another uh, question here from uh, Michael. You mentioned releasing music through a label. How did you get assigned? Um, as in, how did you find the right label and how did you go about approaching them? Um, so I took a lot of time. I went to, um, I met this label, I played, at, me and my band played at Focus Wales, which is a really good networking um, event, music event, and they were there. So, and then I just, e I just emailed the shit out of it, basically. I just emailed, like, emailed them beforehand, emailed a load of other labels that were going, emailed publishers, all sorts, and just, I just thought it was like a numbers game, just keep, and I know not, a lot of people say, oh, they should approach you, blah, 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 but I don't care. I just was like, I'm ready. To work with the label I want to do I've been self-releasing for a while I want to do it so I did that I met people at like events like that I emailed people spoke to them and then we I had an offer from them one other label and a publisher to sort of choose from in the end and then I the conversations just went on for ages they went on for like three or four months and at points I was like oh maybe I'll just I just want to put like I actually this EP that's coming out now has been ready for like a year so you have to have a lot of patience um, is it planned out a date now, is it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, that's how it worked, basically. Like, I, it's not very glamorous. It's not very, um, it's just um, loads of emails. I think <laughs> I think loads of emails, yeah, and, and meeting people. Yeah, you, you've answered it there. I think that, you know, sometimes, you again, it's being proactive, isn't it? You know, I don't think things aren't always going to just land in your lap, but I think you, 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 you know, you've made the decision there and, and took action which I think is um you know yeah. sometimes if you need to make if you need to make that thing happen and I I definitely took once I had the offers I only applied for labels and publishers that I really liked and again I sort of I think COVID I, before that I don't think I was much I was just a doer and not a thinker and I think during um having all that time uh, when nothing was happening I did a lot more thinking um and I honestly just think planning stuff out, like writing down what you want, working out how all your steps are to get there and then working out what you want from a label. Like I wouldn't just sign with any old, you know, somebody's going to put me in a worse off position than I was in. Um, so just taking the time to think about what you want, what they're offering, where you could see your music and just, and then I think you're more likely to reach out to the people that will fit with you as well, maybe. Yeah. Mm. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emily. OK, a uh, question for Rob. Your area of expertise is a little different to the rest of our panel. So could you give us an overview of the sort of, um, day, you know, like day to day activities for, for us, uh, sound for screen specialist? 
Well, I mean, it uh, completely depends on what job I'm on. Um, if I'm on set, it largely means not a lot of sleep um, and a lot of standing around and uh, r chasing after people carrying cameras. Um, but so that side of it is very fun. The post side of things um, is a bit different. Um, for ex so I'm doing a project at the minute, which actually um, I've got Jay from DBS Pro involved with. So he's mixing um, this film. And I've got um, eight students, uh, one from my year who've just finished, and then the students are spread across first and second years and the sound for film course, and I've all brought them onto it to kind of do Foley and stuff. And I think they're all getting really hungry because they're sat there waiting for some work to do. Um, but I'm currently spending each day uh, with a spreadsheet open and the film going through spotting the entire film, um, which has taken me quite a while because it's an action thriller. So there's a a lot of a lot of sounds that need to be done. Um, so that's kind of slightly the less glamorous side of things. Um, I'm really interested. In that. Like how just out out of interest, how long would something that that particular job take? Not I've ever been involved in. So I've I've probably I've probably only really spent about maybe seven or eight hours over the last two days doing it, um, and I'm about thirty minutes through. So, um, cause, cause you need the specific time code and it's every, every little detail. I started out and I was like, okay, I'll do a very brief, um, kind of spotting, spotting sheet for these guys. And then I was like, well, actually I, I should be more specific. Cause otherwise they won't know exactly what I'm talking about. So it's like, if someone puts a cup down and then their elbow nudges a table, I'm, I'm having to put right, look this, this, uh, time code, their elbow touches this, there needs to be a sound there or, and then these are things when we get to mixing, we'll probably go, yeah, that's not necessary once you put the music and everything in but um uh it was kind of something that um do you, you do you remember Mikel Mikel Caruso yeah so uh, obviously he was absolutely amazing person to learn from um and he was very much like look if it's if it, it looks like it's in the film it needs to be in the film we will remove it later if we don't use it which is generally what happens with about uh, I mean I'd say 60 percent of the stuff that you'll end up putting in there anyway um but you know it needs to be done it's, these things need to be done properly um but i mean besides sitting there spotting the film it's really just emails um meetings trying to work out contracts with people that sort of thing all the fun begins when i actually get to go and sit in a studio with with pro tools open or i'm, I'm on set running around um chasing i don't know krampus who's after a bunch of tourists or something i've done loads of wacky horror films so if I, if I mention a crazy name like Krampus, you probably have an idea of what's going on. <laughs> no, no, not personally. But, but, but I mean, that's a bit, I mean, that's, I, very interesting, very interesting. I just, you know, I, so if I'm trying to, yeah, trying to get a handle on like how long something that would take. I can imagine it's a long time. And then, I, how, do you, how does it then come about and, like, and then deciding about the sounds that are not even like, you're visually seeing you know like the sort of non-diegetic stuff like the things that are happening who makes the decisions mm -hmm. on those are they are those coming to you and like so um really that's something i have to i have to sit there with the script um and normally i mean this project's a bit difficult because um the director's in ghana um so it was all shot in ghana it's two hour drama film drama like action thriller kind of film um and arranging meetings with him is very difficult because he's incredibly busy um so i'm having to speak to kind of the production manager who's then relaying information to him and then i'm getting sent i'll get sent things back so it's all kind of up in the air but really it's i mean other productions i've 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 had the conversations with directors and they tell me what they want what they need specifically and then they go if there's anything extra please do it um so little things like that it's just something i kind of have to look at the script and go right well there's supposed to be a radio playing there's no shot of a radio but great that sound needs to be in there um so yeah oh, very interesting that's, that's that was that was purely for my own interest i think <laughs> thank you it's good insight okay so um i think final question i'm just going to sort of uh work across the panelists here so just um just to sort of finish up today um it'd be really nice if just each of you could share one final piece of advice on finding you um you know your way into the industry what what a bit of advice could you give to those um people here today and and uh those who will watch this back in 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 months to come uh we'll start with emily if that's okay sorry to put you on the spot <laughs> i was just thinking i thought like, um uh <laughs> it's a bit cheesy but um i guess 
the reason you want to get into sound is not just because you just want any old job it's because it's what you really love um and you want to do something that you love so um I guess just being clear with yourself about what you really enjoy or if you're not sure yet just explore there's a fly around my head explore like a few <laughs> explore a few options of things you love until that becomes clear um and just yeah just follow your nose basically and work hard and you'll figure out where you, how you kind of fit within it and just follow what you enjoy doing basically and then work out how to live in a capitalist society from it <laughs> All of your passion. <laughs> okay, uh, Joel. Um, yeah, I guess um, kind of latching onto what Emily said. Just yeah, follow your passion. But I guess start it starting out with as wide a foundation as possible. Really, like Emily's Emily's journey was from an artist to a master and engineer. And would you have said initially, Emily, that that was something that you'd like seen yourself doing? Like, no. yes, no, but the reality is, if you have the skills to be able to do it from that outset, then you never know where you can go from there and it may end up benefiting you. Uh, so, uh, get your fingers in all the pies. All the pies, yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. And Chris? <laughs> um, I, I, probably a couple of bits of advice is, I mean, just really work hard on, you know, what you sort of want to achieve if it's your passion just be you know try and be the very best you can at it i guess um and also as well don't give up i mean it is it is quite a sort of hard thing to do but you've got to be true to yourself if you haven't put the effort in and you're sort of doing it half assed as such then there's a reason why no one's getting back to you and there's a reason why it's not happening you just got to give it you, you all really and then from that i think things happen you know um so that's probably my, my bit of advice on it really Thanks, Chris. I think that's great advice. And I think what we what I've definitely got from today is that a lot of um, you are bringing in work through sort of word of mouth, and that doesn't happen for doing a half assed job, does it? You know, you're yeah. you're putting in, you know, above and beyond to make sure that you're delivering something that is fantastic for the people that are, are paying you to do that. And definitely, and it's your passion as well. So it's not really hard work at the end of the day. No, I'm sorry, I shouldn't even use the term work there, should I? <laughs> Well, no, no, it's true though, isn't it? It's something that you really, really enjoy doing anyway, or you should. If you find it a chore, then it's not for you, really. Indeed. Um, it's something that you, you just, you, you do, and, and yeah, just keep at it and, and, and mm -hmm. work hard at your craft, really. Thank you. And, and Rob, did you hear that? If it's a chore, well, you know, seven hours in, 30 minutes into the thing, it's still not a chore, is it, Rob? You're still, you're still having a No, <laughs> no, weirdly enough, I'm, I'd rather enjoy myself. I think I think it's the, the journey, but, you know, building building the soundscape and seeing the finished result. Um, but if I, I mean, I, I don't even know if there's anything I can really add, you know, if you're passionate enough and you care about something, um, you know, you'll always succeed. You know, ma you manifest these things for yourself, don't you? Um, so if you don't put in the effort, don't expect to get anywhere. But, um, you know, if you focus, knuckle down and crack on, then you'll see success. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. I think I can only echo that. I think, you know, um, over the years and especially seeing the students have come through, and I think it's something a couple of you touched on earlier. Um, you know, Chris, you mentioned this and uh, Joel, I think as well, like so much time you spent doing it in the studio, making the most of that time available and, and, and really putting the hours in. And I think that that when we look at the students who come through, go on and, and are incredibly successful and have that drive and motivation, there's a really common theme there uh, across all of them. And, you know, it's, it's that thing of like we're shutting up now. You've got you've got to go, you know. <laughs> so, I think I think great advice there is just to is really put that put those hours in and uh, enjoy what you do. Yeah, yeah, really. yeah, and don't put a compressor on something just because you feel like you should. Great advice, that perfect advice, Joel. <laughs> I guess. Okay, so okay. thank you so much. I, it's genuinely lovely to speak to you all and I wish you great success uh, with everything else that you uh, and, and venture on with.